Greetings to one and all. For those who are joining in from Manila and those who are joining from the US, welcome. The Metropolitan Museum of Manila has the pleasure of welcoming you all to the second installment of Art Inspires, a series of exclusive interviews with artists, curators, scholars, and writers. These conversations will focus on artists' processes and experiences in reference to their work or body of works as featured in ongoing exhibitions of the museum. Our second series, Heritage, Identity, and Nationhood, is anchored on the Met's current exhibition in full view, the Metropolitan Museum of Manila Collection, which can also be viewed online in 3D format. The works in our collection is a reference to a visual narrative and documentation of the 45 year history of the museum as a cultural institution. The works have been gathered over time as gifts and bequests by Met friends and benefactors, and they present a veritable story that speaks of the development of Philippine art in recent years and works by modern and contemporary artists from the Philippines and abroad. And today we are very fortunate and very honored to have two of these artists who will be talking to us about their experimental collaborative art performance and video entitled Mother Load. Welcome, Ms. Josephine Jing Taralba and Ms. Angel Velasco Shaw. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. They will be in conversation with the curator of In Full View, Ms. Desi Tolentino, and Ms. Alec Abaro, the Met's Deputy Director for Education Programming. And to get us all started, I'd like to introduce Ms. Desi Tolentino, the curator of the exhibition. Ms. Tolentino has been with the Metropolitan Museum's curatorial and collections team and is now curating and doing other works uh, for other cultural institutions. Desi, welcome. Good morning. Good evening. Welcome, Tina, for my presentation. I will be partially talking about the collection of the museum and how it has uh, formed, especially after uh, post-1986, and how what the collecting imperative of the museum was, and how this would uh, potentially tie in as well with the Met's current um, programming for uh, ac um, acquiring uh, new contemporary works of art because it, the Met has also been acquiring really critical um, artworks during the 1990s. But um, of course, um, with the um, with how this um, idea or this notion of uh, collecting started at the Met is hinged in its, um, or of course, like pro programming and also its freedom of art for all. And this ties to how the Met um, wanted to define heritage of uh, during the 1990s. Um, we have a question here that asks, how do we define heritage in a modern and increasingly virtual society, we start with um, what heritage would really mean to us. Um, I remembered asking this question before in a, in a prior um, discussion as well, like how, what memories do you recall when you think about your own hometown or how um, we give or how our parents, for example, give meaning our name and of course past heirlooms from generation to generation um, in family line so this is kind of how we start to encounter heritage more intimately in our lives it is the storytelling of course and the meaning making or um in giving imbibing significance and forming values on objects or actions or performances that we encounter intimately, personally. Um, of course, both 
as ourselves and within communities, right? So um, there are formal definitions for heritage as well when we apply this to practice, and it is something that I also encounter, um, such as the um, giving the giving of um, meaning and how do we ascribe meaning to things that, for example, Filipinos put value in. So um, there are already certain factors that we um, we think of when we do this. So it is in like the significance that we find historically. So it is our history, architecturally. Um, it is also like the aesthet aesthetics of it, scientifics, um, the social and of course symbolic. So these are these are also like very nebulous terms when we talk about heritage. But um, for for like specific to this discussion, um, we will be narrowing down these uh, resources, like kind of like cultural assets, so to speak, to um, like what is important for the met. Like for example, you see here the the museum itself in 2020, and um, this was when uh, you can see the facade, right? And it is extremely brutalist in nature. It is very um, uh, geometric. It is dark, and the initial um, in, um, the initial motivation, the architectural impulse for this museum is to refer to the fort that is actually hidden behind it. This is called the Fort San Antonio Abad. You see here, this is a very recent photo and it is mercurially um, curated, I guess. It is, it is very pleasing in its space as a function, of course, as a place of sightseeing and function. Um, and um, this fort, of course, has been around for a long time, and um, it will be um, it will be um, clearly um, enunciated later on by some of the speakers that I will have uh, that we will have today. But of course, these are the weight of heritage that we kind of that we kind of encounter. It is in the structures. It is in. Of course, um, I mentioned earlier that there are there are, there are matters such as historical, architectural aesthetic, correct? So, where do where do works of art come into play with this? Because in a way, when we look at heritage, um, we as we again we ascribe a significance to it, and at the same time, these different sorts of significances are bound by paradigm and are of course state enforced and are standardized. So um, with this, we go to the history of the museum itself in that it is a, um, all of, it is a kind of machination and patronage of the arts that started from the Marcos administration during the 1960s actually. So, um, these projects maintain a sort of vision and a consciousness of our people to our cultural heritage and the cultivation and enhancement of public interest in and the appreciation of distinct Philippine arts in various fields. So this is kind of like the, um, again, like the imperative, it is the modus when we, or when we look at these kinds of projects that happen at the time. Um, Imelda Marcos undertook an extensive public works project in Manila. And during the 1976 International Mon Monetary Fund World Bank meetings, that's when the Met Museum uh, was unveiled. And it is distinctly to exhibit non Philippine art. So the, here we see, like, the, these are the really big, um, I guess you can say, really big, important. Um, really crowd drawing um, exhibitions of the time. So the of course we see like all of these earlier exhibitions are really um, about um, 
how do you say like just showcasing it is a general showcase of different paintings uh different artifacts that were coming from the united states that were coming from soviet russia that were coming from um <clears throat> what do you call this like of mexico of course yugoslavia etc so um during this time of course um while the met was distinctly for non filipino art we have other state governed museums such as the ccp the money museum of the central bank the uh, museum of philippine art which of course kind of like functions as a sister museum to the met before for the philippine visual arts and um it was only in 1986 um that it, the museum had a different had a turning point um as soon as like of course there is a turning point in philippine history right um where under the leadership of Ms. Feli Santa Maria, um, the Met um, had to veer away from, of course, having this kind of history to um, embody a more, um, I would suppose it's a more um, all-inclusive banner of art for all, right? So this, this kind of espoused in sharing art with the public audience to as the um, historical or as the met text would go to uplift the human spirit and, and it is the impetus for its didactic bilingual holistic approach to programs and exhibition making um, since 1986 so this kind of takes place through traveling exhibitions workshops and of course the acquisition of the art of which you see here um, a majority of the collection of the Met also came from that period. This is initiated by Cora Alvina, who took, oh, where, who, um, with her, with her leadership, she, the collection began to take form in 1995 through the um, donation of artists, their families, and private, and also private collectors. So, it was the first time in 20 years that the Met has held its own permanent collection of Philippine art, um, of course, many of which are works from that period in the 1980s. Um, so for, for this, though, we, we, we can see that um, there are um, connections of, um, of these different um, pieces of, of these different artworks that are concerned with the, national heritage that are concerned of course with art education so there are um different themes or different uh, or a diverse um aspect of artistic approaches visual commentaries especially on social ecological and political issues for the local identity um you can see here we have the work of um anna Fur. And Anna for herself is also a, a visual artist, is a painter. And when she creates works of art, it is very anecdotal. It is kind of like her own um, visual diary, a record of feelings, a state of being of how she um, kind of like um, puts into form her um, motivations for women, especially Filipino women, against the uh, the landscape or the backdrop of experiencing um, heritage in her own way and having conflicts with that said heritage. So you see here, there is <clears throat> an interplay between indigenous culture and westernization from her paintings and India Ilust Illustrada, India and Illustrada, um, with um, India, quote unquote, India at the uh, right, Illustrada at the left. And they are in a face off. On one side, you have um, Illustrada 
in a colonial dress, Filipina, juxtaposed with images of a church. And of course, you see here on the bottom, there is a woman kneeling and or bowing to a priest who looks down upon her. And facing her is a bare-breasted, also Filipina, named India, covered in tattoos. In the center of the image, you see here the red earth, right? Sliced in half by a cross-tipped sword. So it, in itself, this um, perspective of anathur, of tilled red earth, kind of like brings into consideration how we look on land or how we look upon land and our relationship with land. Because in a way, um, this kind of refers back to the hacendas and encomiendas. Again, like tracing back to, um, going back to the motivation of, you know, like um, uh, the Spanish colonizer and land and grabbing land for example, these this really, really strong element and where these manifestations of a collective memory are eroded and um, were forcibly disallowed for for us or and destroyed. And again, these sub this subjugation of the earth for her will may parallel the subjugation of women. So this is this is kind of like her um, the ideas, the context that she came in, and you that she came in with, and you see here that um, she is very well known for her mural-sized paintings and incorporations of ethnic motives. You, um, this um, image that you see here is one of the um, initial or is the major exhibition for Anifer. It is a solo exhibition. Called Earth Triptych, which is which took place at the Cultural Center of the Philippines in the 90s. Um, at the center, this is animist Earth, Rupang uh, Animistico, and the latter one is called Wasteland, Lupang Pagas. And again, it is an interplay on her themes of the Earth and of woman, a womanhood. So um, this is a really powerful triptych. It would, in its totality, unfortunately, two um, artworks are not within the museum. It is in the personal collection of artists. It portends to events of the day and is, instills a resonance of themes of Philippine identity that is in conflict with our notions of nationhood. And of course, a heteronormativity of how we or what we perceive as women or the family unit, right? In itself, there is there is really still a clash, and and you know, um, it kind of like Anna for Anna for's paintings in a way still still would resonate with some of these instant or these themes themes still today, and the latter recalls or calls to calls forth ideas of an impending um, ecological disaster for it to be um, successively portrayed as something that will go last, right? And um, in the middle, in, in the meantime, this is animist earth, the tree of life in this, in this sense to her represents woman, fertility and life there and it calls for the belief or the old belief systems that um, um, Filipinos would have had like before in our belief in nature in our belief in a um, a very fertile and active surrounding so um the, so you you see these very interesting um, interplays. How would meanwhile? How would it connect for um, towards heritage? It's it's actually something that you can derive 
a lot of meaning to um and in a way this um this will also be brought into consideration again once we move on actually to the work of uh, Josephine Toralba, Miss Jane Toralba, and Angel until the last question, as they would speak more about their experiences and encounters with the same encounter that Anna for herself as a painter, an activist, um, muralist, and um, ascribing meaning into images, into um, narratives, again, a visual diary. Four bullets multiply for centuries, echoing. The Vietnamese soldier is quick to grasp the techniques involved in copter-borne counteraction to guerrilla raids on country villages, and he uses his new knowledge well. In cities around the world, activists are rallying for action on climate change. Tens of thousands filled the streets of cities like Melbourne, Rio de Janeiro, Berlin and Paris. Among those marching are celebrities plus world leaders. He was a man who was full of enthusiasm. He loved them the mountains. And he thought that he would be able to pursue his passion moving into the Juju area in Algeria. He was abducted. Decapitated. And he was beheaded. Voilà ce que le terrorisme fait. This is what terrorism does. Il ne le fait pas qu'à la France. It doesn't do it only Il y a to France. Encore, uh, quelques jours, c'était américain, anglais, ago, par, uh, la même barbarie. British people who were 
dealing with the same level of barbarity. Daesh. These groups and this particular ne group, pas Daesh, simplement ceux qui ne pensent pas comme lui. they don't strike only those who don't musulmans. think like they do. They Ils also strike Muslims. Civiles. They also strike Ils civilian populations minorités. and they strike minorities. Ils violent, ils tuent. They rape, voilà pourquoi they kill. Le combat que it is for this reason that the mener. fight that the international community needs to wage against terrorism knows no borders. But we have to learn the right lessons. Yes to careful preparation. No to rushing to join a conflict without a clear plan. But we must not be so frozen with fear that we don't do anything at all. Isolation and withdrawing from a problem like ISIL will only make matters worse. We must not allow past mistakes to become an excuse for indifference or inaction. The right lesson is that we should act, but act differently. Casting gold. Casting gold. Sa barangay Santo Domingo, Tatalon at Talayan, napuno na ang simbahan pero patuloy naman daw ang misa sa my parish center. Nagdisula namang lawang pahabaan ng Araneta Avenue mula sa kanto ng Quezon Avenue tapos ng Pino Rodriguez Avenue. Tanging mga rescue boat lang ang nakakatawid. Extremism is not a regional issue that only the nations of our region have to grapple with. Extremism is a global issue. Right now, everybody has the best of intentions, but people are not putting in the kinds of resources that are necessary to put a stop to this epidemic. There's still a significant gap between where we are and where we need to be. Uh, we are human beings and this is the part of our, of our human nature that we don't learn the importance of anything until it's snatched from our hands. And when in Pakistan, when we were stopped from going to school, at that time I realized that education is very important and education is the power for women. And that's why the terrorists are afraid of education. Thanks, Ms. Tina and Desi for the introduction and to our audience for watching with us that experimental collaborative video. I'm Alec from The Met, here to usher us into the next part of the program, a talk back with the artists, followed by a conversation and Q&A with everyone. I'd like to start by formally introducing the artists behind the, the video we've just watched. So, Josephine Turalba is a multidisciplinary artist based between Manila and Boston who explores issues of divide and convergence within a volatile geopolitical world order. Her works reflect on the politics of violence and dynamics of infliction and trauma, 
depicting spaces where empathy translates into healing. She negotiates influences from different cultures, taking on an investigative approach to place and time in relationship to a sense of self. Turalba's nomadic relation to various forms of media, including performance, installation, experimental video, photography, tapestry, and painting allows her to explore her obsessions with socio-political narratives, myths, and personal histories. She holds an MFA in New Media from Trans Art Institute in New York, USA, and Donau Universitat Krems in Austria. She serves as Dean at the School of Fine Arts and Design at Philippine Women's University. She has also been awarded with many fellowships, grants, and residencies across the globe. Her works have been exhibited at ICA Singapore, London Biennale, uh, as well as the Malta Contemporary Arts Center, the Cultural Center of the Philippines, and many more. Collaborating with her in this video is Angel Velasco Shaw, a visual and media artist, educator, curator, and cultural organizer living in Manila and New York City. Her experimental documentaries, such as Inherited Memories, when absence becomes presence, mother load, which we've just witnessed, the momentary enemy, umbilical cord, Asian boys, and nailed, have screened internationally in festivals, museums, and schools. And cross-cultural exchange projects include not visual noise, provocations, Philippine documentary photography as co-curator, the inverted telescope, markets of resistance, women as mythical hero, vestiges of war and empire and memory, repercussions and evocations of the 1899 Philippine-American War. She also has publications such as the Anthology of Vestiges of War and the Aftermath of an Imperial Dream, co-edited with Louise H. Francia, uh, published by the New York University Press, as well as a self-published uh, book called Silent Stories, and she has also a forthcoming Markets of Resistance Anthology from the Ateneo de Manila University Press. So Ms. Jing and Ms. Angel will share with us their artistic process and practice, the research and behind-the-scenes production, and their collaboration. Everyone, join me in welcoming Josephine Toralba and Angel Velasco Shaw. Thanks for the generous introduction. <laughs> uh, Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Angel Velasco Shaw. I am not a Zoomer, so please bear with me. And uh, I hope you like my, my guest room. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to thank the Metropolitan Museum of Manila President Tina Kaliko, um, Ala Cabarro, the Met Education Officer and her team, and curator Mercedes Tolentino for inviting me to participate in the Art Inspires series. It's a wonderful opportunity for me to engage in an exciting dialogue with you about Motherload, a collaborative project between my colleague and kindred spirit, Josephine Taralba, especially because we have never spoken publicly about this project. National hero Jose Rizal once said, he who does not know how to look back at where he came from will never get to his destination. The themes and topics addressing heritage, identity, and nationhood are very dear to my heart. Throughout my adult life, they have featured prominently in my creative and intellectual practices as a media and visual artist, curator, and educator. Before I share my stories about my role as the director videographer and editor of Motherload, I would like to take you on a little journey with me throughout personal and collective Philippine and US history and memory and show how these relationships, experiences and events have impacted my creative process that is inseparable from my life and very much a part of what constitutes my identity, understanding of heritage and sense of nationhood in a complex and contradictory way all of which are all in flux all the time. In 1997, I was awarded an Asian Cultural Council artist residency that extended into 1998. Uh, during this nine month period of time, I focused mainly on rewriting a draft of my first narrative feature film script, 
which by the way, I'm still writing because I've been doing other things. Um, at that time, I was also simultaneously developing um, my multidisciplinary project uh, called Vestiges of War. I also conducted an advanced documentary workshop at UP Film Center with 12 people called Creating Presence for 100 Years of Absence of Filipino Women's History that was set within the 100th year commemoration of the Philippine Revolution against Spain and a presidential election. In a series of montages, I asked the workshoppers and people from the markets to malls in Metro Manila questions about what a hero means, who their heroes and heroines are, what they think of centennial celebration and what they think the role of woman is today. Within this contemporary context, bridging history to today, searching for the stories of my female ancestors, interweaving movie posters, historical monuments, TV commercials, election posters, archival photographs, depicting the Philippine Revolution, Philippine American War, and images of society's heroes. Some of these kinds of um, images and techniques you do see repeating in Motherlode. Um, I, I think you can, uh, you will see that in a minute when I show this first clip. Um, umbilical cord, like, like most of my other experimental documentaries, was produced guerrilla style, shot, edited, directed, and produced by myself, as well as written. I had no formal training in film, having come out of a painting and photography background. My motto has always been, if you have an idea, work it through. Work with what you have, research, create, and live the questions that you want to address. Use your fears and all else will follow. If the piece is meant to go out into the world, it will. So this is the first clip. To create presence, one must go back into darkness. into intervals of pain and joy, denial, discovery, and reconciliation, creating presence for a hundred years of absence of Filipino women's history. What was I thinking? Blowing on the extinguishing embers until they reignite within all that we experience day to day. Blowing on the extinguishing embers until Filipino women's faces and their stories reappear in our imaginations. Film and video making is like painting for me. The process is circular, images and sound linking together in a backwards and forwards motion. Each piece connects to the next as part of a non-linear continuum. Similar to the experimental documentary filmmakers who have influenced me, Trin Thi Minh Ha, French filmmaker Chris Marker, and national artist Kidlat Tahimik, I became interested in combining notions of ethnographic filmmaking with fictional situations in order to explore the relationships between objectivity and subjectivity, insider and outsider dynamics, colonial and post-colonial conditions. We want to change the image of women because they're, um, before, I think even now, they're becoming objects of desire. Um, we want to show that women um, can be leaders, can govern the people. Uh -huh. 
hero is someone na uh, you try to follow, you try to emulate. At siguro yun yung reason kaya wala akong hero is because I don't know anyone who still doesn't know what to do. Like me, I don't know what to do. So, sino pwede kong maging hero? No one. MTV. <laughs> wala. Wala akong... Um, I'm still... I'm still doing my search for that particular person. I'm still trying to figure out what to do with my life. I was her grandchild from America, her youngest daughter's oldest female child. The day before I was to return to the States, I knelt at her feet. She told me stories about the Philippines of her childhood, every word carefully translated to me. The places and the events, even the terrain that she spoke about are different. Her Philippines that my mother left in 1957 for America is not the same place as now. I want to be able to see these stories, see these landscapes, experience them through her descriptions, live with her through the telling of memories. My mother and aunts remember what my grandmother can no longer relay to me. Sometimes, they cannot speak. In the past 36 years of addressing issues of heritage, identity, and nationhood, I've come to understand the necessity of crossing categorical boundaries in everyday life. It is my hope that my work will continue in this vein of building cross-cultural bridges, while at the same time validating Filipino-American experiences. The body of work that I produce continues to evolve in a series of explorations into legacies of colonialism, empire, empire building, war, cultural representation, identity politics, and the post-colonial condition. At that time of making umbilical cord, I was in what I would call the intermediate stage of understanding Spanish and American colonial histories and their profound impact on generations of Filipinos which I hope that you can get a sense of also through the way I'm showing these clips with my talking. My grandmother was five when the national hero Jose Rizal was executed by the Spaniards in 1896. She was eight when the Philippine-American War broke out, a war written in indelible ink, not in American history books, only as paragraphs here and there in Philippine history books. Yet there are images of American soldiers standing on mounds of skulls and bones piled up in mass graves, evidence of betrayal. Two hundred fifty thousand Filipinos dead, the official count. Women raped, children casualties of American expansionism. Sold for twenty million dollars. Lolo Celestino was exiled in Hong Kong with Aguinaldo. Exile was in the blood, a mock battle, 1898. Two flags are hoisted, American and Filipino. Kindness turns to deceit, re-Christianizing the savages. My grandmother never told me these stories.
as is evident in the viewing of, of umbilical cord, um, I incorporated similar editing, um, camera, media, appropriation and image and text uh, techniques in mother load, um, which I really hope that we can um, talk about, really get into a conversation about all of these layers of things that you're seeing um, um, after Josephine um, presents. Um, there's a continuum, um, a crossover um, in terms of these two pieces um, and a continuum of my style um, the content and critical thinking. Um, Mother Load is a meditative piece exploring the convergent effects of historical events and current affairs in the Philippines that ranged from the Spanish and American colonialism, the Philippine American War, the World War II Battle of Manila. Um, you can see some of that footage um, in and out of Mother Load. Um, the Vietnam War, 9-11, um, uh, protests against government corruption and uh, Typhoon Yolanda. Um, Josephine's haunting performance intercut with mainstream TV news coverage of world leaders speeches at the 2014 UN Climate Summit addressing climate change, ISIS, the Ebola outbreak, and displacement of people from wars, terrorism, and greed furthers the way um, in which I wanted to explore notions of heritage, identity, and nationhood. Since my very first video piece, um, there are images that repeat from project to project. Um, hopefully you can see some of them that were featured in umbilical cord in the clips that you saw and also in mother load although they do go, go by fairly quickly. Um, my professional relationship and friendship with Josephine was really serendipitous. But, um, before relocating to the Philippines in 2013 or 2013 for seven and a half years, I was developing a project that I wanted to include her in. Um, soon after I arrived in Manila, she and I met for lunch and Josephine asked me if I wanted to, if I would be interested in serving as a graduate advisor and mentor for students in Philippine Women's University, um, you know, where she was dean. Um, so I wanted to, so I went to meet with her and see her department. And soon after, you know, speaking with her and running into an old friend of mine who actually I think may be watching this. Um, Nookie, Noel Cuisan. Um, I agreed to, I didn't realize it, but I think I might've been in some form of a job interview and I agreed to actually start teaching there, uh, which was really great. Um, so from that moment on, uh, Jing and I collaborated, collaborated on many different kinds of endeavors, um, academic and artistic. Um, and later I also curated um, an exhibition of hers, a solo exhibition that she did at Dua Mila in 2020. So having said all this, um, thank you for allowing me to present um, parts of my process and my practice with you. And I'd like to introduce Josephine Taraba. Thank you, Angel. I'll share my presentation. Our choice of venue for the video was strategic because of its position um, between two powerful institutions. So there's the Fort Abad, the Metropolitan Museum of Manila, and the Central Bank of the Philippines. Uh, the two large uh, structures towering over a dwarfed national cultural treasure. We thought that its position made visible another metaphorical connection uh, the mystical creature landing in the manicured garden, an oasis, a breathing space situated between the Met, the repository of gold digging and art collections, and the central bank responsible for the country's gold reserves. Uh, it is not as big as its big brothers in Intramuros uh, that guards the gates of the walled city, but it is equally interesting uh, built in 1584, its task was to guard the route 
or road from Cavite to Manila, and then eventually uh, also to guard the rear of Intramuros. The origins of this fort date back from 1584, captured by the British in 1762, and rebuilt at the beginning of the 19th century when it was called La Polvorista, as it was used as the gunpowder depot. The fort's ruins is also symbolic as the site where the Americans first raised their flag after occupying Manila in 1898 and before the outbreak of the Philippine-American War. Uh, today, it is a well-manicured garden used by the Central Bank for events, and it's also open to the public um, at scheduled time. Uh, when I was invited by um, the Met to include some of my work for the 2014 Met Open, I thought how I could engage as a multidisciplinary artist Two of my tapestries were included, and I also proposed a live performance and a video installation. A video installation where I invited Angel to collaborate with me. I asked her to create um, a narrative, a narrative connecting my work, um, which I did in uh, Germany, entitled In Wonderland, with the actual Met Open. Um, and she thought of bringing and creating the narrative of bringing the protagonist back to the homeland or in here, in this case, we call the motherland uh, and played on the words of the title. So instead of motherland, it is a uh, mother load. Um, and uh, and the load um, being uh, the... Um, uh, L L O D E is a term used when you find a, like the line or in the gold mine, um, and and of course L O A D would be um, having to carry some weight. Um, so as the narrative goes, the protagonist uh, in my previous work in Wonderland comes back to her homeland. Um, this work. In Wonderland, um, made in uh, during my residency in Germany, uh, explored the notion of power struggle in various locations of the world, described in political literature as third world or land, to propose that all and everyone exists in my artist assumed Wonderland a wonderland of continuous conflict. Uh, in this video, a goddess comes out of the field dressed up in a bullet dress fabricated in the residency. This almost science fiction protagonist walks the asphalt, a road within the field, flirts with a camera and goes back to the mysterious wonderland never to be seen again. The images depict a mixed role of the goddess of the fields as well as the vulnerable human engulfed in bullets. Both roles engage audience to contemplate the thin line between fiction and reality. The golden vessel, Kinari, is an element that uh, we referred to when um, I created this mythical creature, a half human, half bird creature representing uh, enlightened action. In a way, I have occupied this vessel and flown through time and space to come back to my homeland for um, Motherload. I was inspired by this image when I visited the gold collection. It's in the Ayala Museum. And this was found um, together with other gold pieces in Surigao in 1981. So there was a live performance that happened during the um, opening uh, and the live performance came immediately after the video was um, the pre-recorded video, which we um, showed of Mother Load was uh, 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 shown. And um, this live performance is untitled, but it was um, it was meant to interact 
uh, with the Met Open Artwork. So here you see her um, coming back from her homeland with fresh new eyes as if seeing her land um, for the first time. I took the uh, character of um, like uh, cautiousness, playfulness, innocence, and having a childlike curiosity. Uh, so here she uh, uh, mimics the position of the sculpture of Agnes uh, Aureliano. Um, and here she flirts with the sculpture of Toen Imao and um, the works of Leroy New. The, uh, the performance at the fourth of the video was yeah, pre-recorded, as I said. Um, uh, so this, because uh, the public wasn't allowed to come in and it was going to be evening into the fort um, abad, so we decided to pre-record it. Um, during the planning and rehearsals at the fort, we experimented and created the script, choosing spots where I would stop and interact with objects like the cannon and this canal or narrow passageway, following and trusting our intuition, as Angel and I share a very common thread. Um, uh, we worked for several years, as, and she, I, I don't want to get into that. I, I, I guess she already shared that. Um, and now I want to speak about making the material that I use. So interacting, um, the cannonballs that I use, uh, I made them out of fiberglass, but they were hollow. Uh, and so they kept rolling around and during our, um, during the performance. So how did we solve this? We filled it, we filled it with sand. And because of its weight for the wings, right? I had to look for a design that would distribute the weight evenly across my body for longer performances. And I found a device used by Alexander McQueen. The wings have a front and back part, and they are fastened snugly around my torso for ease of movement. So just a little bit about um, how I made them. So they're made from empty bullet shells, and uh, they're cut up, flattened, and then soldered and riveted back together into a new design. Uh, part of the inventory of materials uh, and elements that recur in my works are discarded bullets. Uh, in a way, they can be considered as repurposing, but really mostly for more of a personal journey, uh, the process of deconstruction of bullets and transforming them into artworks was my way of coping with a personal tragedy where I lost my uh, father to four bullets. Uh, it's in a way that was a phase in my career where I was uh, neutralizing the emotional and psychological hold of these materials on me. Uh, this is immensely um, and deeply personal, um, but I think that violence has been brought about by the collective consciousness of a war culture. Uh, and many of my works um, investigate um, this uh, politics of violence. Uh, war, occupation, colonialism, greed, uh, geopolitical and sociopolitical issues. These materials uh, reappear in my other works as well. And I'd like to briefly and quickly take you through a solo exhibition I had in 2020, curated by uh, Angel. So you'll also see, again, the collaborative, collaborative nature uh, of our uh, working relationship. So this is one work um, from my last show in uh, 2020, uh, before the pandemic began. It's called High Wire High Seas. Uh, I mean, the show was called High Wire High Seas. And this particular piece is uh, the Panganiban Reef. So you, here you see uh, materials that I use. Again, the uh, bullets are there, um, uh, discarded. Um, toys of my uh, children, and I used uh, the weaving shuttle uh, of weavers, and I used them to um, represent uh, boats you know, as a way of uh, travel. 
as many of my projects usually happen, it starts intuitively and um, they actually address uh, complex current events and visual metaphors. And um, if you see, these are uh, the islands also. Um, the project looked into the president's development of closer ties with China. The uh, islands you see here are the uh, disputed, well, we're not supposed to call them disputed islands, but uh, in the West Philippine Sea. China has been claiming these islands as theirs. And you can see um, the development of these in 10 years, um, on a 2006 to 2018, so that would be almost 15 years, um, how Kagitingan Reef uh, was transform transformed from a blue rich lagoon um, with diverse marine resources and now uh, transformed into a military base complete with a runway. This uh, exhibition, the approach was more playful and there's a subtle and indirect um, uh, approach to this very sensitive topic. This methodology I used to, ha uh, to have uh, in art be a means of critical engagement, to touch on social political issues without getting over positional uh, that borders on activism. <laughs> um, so we see the playful installation of these toy parachutes, which I redesigned, each one like a casino chip alluding to the political games um, played by politicians amidst the gravity of imminent wars, perversely making light of underlying tension. 20 designs with elements pertaining to terms that relatively uh, positively and negatively, uh, uh, sorry, related to the Belt and Road Initiative uh, of China. Terms such as progress may be interpreted as protest, Belt and Road as, a, um, as in building an empire. Uh, terms such as aid, may be interpreted as entry, uh, showed, uh, showing tensions between the term, and at the same time, they're all part of the big initiative of Belt and Road. Um, culture, for example, and intervention. Uh, design elements consisted of military air, land, sea craft, camouflage, Chinese patterns, online gaming, equipment, for warfare, uh, playing cards, trees, barbed wires, etc. Backed up with the issues uh, around the so-called Easternization and the so-called New World Order. Um, a montage of news footages and news agent uh, news agencies such as GMA 60, GMA ABS Al Jazeera Channel News, etc., uh, was playing inside a tent. So here you see a life-size uh, parachute, uh, which we con uh, converted into a tent. Um, and um, reimagined it to uh, echo a campsite. Um, and this echoes the toy parachutes that were installed outside. It was covered with camouflage and the video was playing inside. Um, again, uh, this video piece unifies the symbols repeated in the exhibition and um, they represent um, issues regarding the Belt and Road Initiative and the Spratly Islands, which is part of the Belt and Road Initiative in a way. This video piece is similar in approach to that of Mother Load uh, and to come back around, bring you back to mother load, many of the themes and techniques run parallel to angels practice in the video. And that is why the collaboration between us in mother load was very fruitful. So I stop here and I'll bring it back to Alex. Alex, thank you. Thank you for the insightful presentations, Ms. Jing and Ms. Angel. So we now proceed with the discussion and Q&A section in the program. 
to our audience send in your questions and comments in the Zoom chat box. And now we'd also like to bring in Desi back to begin our conversation. So my first question uh, has something to do with uh, the way we navigate collaborations. So Ms. Jing and Ms. Angel, both of you are arts practitioners. And like many practitioners uh, in the country, you're both very versatile. You're not only an artist, but also educators, writers, uh, academics. So when you collaborate, how do you navigate these relationships between artist to artist, as co-artists, as artist and curator, especially in the time of the pandemic when face-to-face -face interaction is very limited? Well, actually, it's kind of... I just actually, in relationship to a pandemic or working virtually or long distance, um, you know, there was in... in as colleagues at, at PWU, um, both of us often would be in and out of the country. Um, so we would have to communicate about the projects that we were working on together in school. Um, Jing as, as the Dean and me as one of the, one of the faculty members and developing an institute for mm -hmm. the university at that time. Um, but when we were working on Motherload, um, Jing was in a residency in Istanbul. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think because we really are in tune in so many ways, um, and maybe it's also because we're both Sagittarians, <laughs> I don't know, um, could be, but um, we had to no. work on the piece from afar, right? So I would send um, Jing, this is after she and I had shot the performance. We went through everything. Um, it was in the editing stages. And so I had to, um, I would send clips to Jing. We would talk about it a little bit, you know, and that process can be very effective in a lot of ways too. Um, in a weird way, that kind of distance. And it can also be very challenging, but, you know, I think um, like now, Right, we're coordinating, Ching and I were coordinating with our presentations and how we could bounce off each other. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, and also, I, you know, I don't, I can't speak for Jen, but for myself, I can't separate anything. So um, that versatility and, and diversity of, of what the things that I do is just all part of me. And sometimes it's hard to compartmentalize. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought um, that, you know, how we as artists um, don't separate our, our art with our life. Um, it just uh, uh, flows through um, within each other. And um, I think Angel and I share many um, many a common moments in mm -hmm. our lives that we, we really understand each other in several levels. Um, yeah, and it, so it works, yeah. yeah. I come <laughs> as a museum worker, Desi. I do have like a mountain of questions and really like interesting um, like points, thorough lines to draw towards, and it's it's nice that you brought up you brought that up, especially in in this current times. No, but um, in in line actually with what Alec what what Alec did ask, I wanted to um uh, raise the inquiry on being the artist traveler because there is there is like this really um um you ironic but at the same time. You know, it's kind of like going full circle when it comes to um, um, the mobility that um, that you have as artists, right? Where before uh, we are uniquely familiar with the trope of the illustrado, right? That goes like that journeys and um, at, um, that journeys around the world, and then is also remained rooted in a sense of belonging to, to the Philippines as the homeland and then here um, we have these um, like 
transnational exchanges and um it's 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 a it's a really um uh what do you what do you call this like really interesting concern when we have like the conversation of the artist traveler that in in spite of like working for like extended periods away from the Philippines in a way has this kind of really flexible citizenship where um as migrants there there is still a very strong link back to the nation in terms of family um uh, like family um and also like a sense of um culture right so like I, I i want to hear like the um how this kind of like confluence has also helped with your artistic practices um well in my case i was um born in los angeles and raised mm -hmm. in new york um i'd been going back and forth to the philippines since i was three years old um you know, but it, in 1981, um, you, you saw a lot of images of my Lala, uh, the yeah. older woman. Um, you know, she really inspired everything I've ever done, actually. And I only met her three times in my life. That's how profound her link is, our link is. Um, so for me, I, I, I sought out, um, I don't think I ever had a sense of home. Um, you know, despite the physical, you know, you do have mm -hmm. a home, right? But, um, you know, I, I was always a wanderer, actually, since I was a little kid. And, you know, what we call transnationalism or transnational experiences, um, I didn't know that that was my life, right? Until other people said that. And in terms of, you know, the creativity comes out of all those life experiences, basically. Um, and, you know, I think Jane can share her differences being born and raised in the Philippines and going out, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I, I guess as a, an artist, one can never be, uh, one needs new inputs always. Um, and I'm lucky to be able to travel and um, uh, get grants and have some residencies internationally. Um, and how, and I wanted to uh, answer uh, Noel's question within this uh, question, right? Uh, while doing a collaborative project, how are you able to resolve them? Resolve them? Uh, also being a transnational artist, when you call transnational, you deal with many kinds of people, many different cultures. Um, and when um, I collaborate with other people, uh, what I tend to do is, when, and when conflicts arise, what I tend to do is really look in, from their point of view, um, mm -hmm. put myself in their position, and it's easy for us as artists to do that because we always take so many and investigate many points of view. Um, and then, you know, I uh, try it on and then discuss, you know, um, in a calm way. Uh, and then, yeah. you know, we work it out. I mean, uh, some people have very positional, some artists are very positional uh, and don't budge, but that's why um, you have the chemistry as well, uh, when you um, collaborate with someone and you choose to collaborate with another one, there you consider your chemistry, your um, working relationship, but never, never discount the fact that you will fight. Right, you know? it's but, inevitable. Uh, right, it's inevitable, right. but at the end of it all, remember the com commitment is to the project, it's not, really it's not personal so when you discuss and have conflict i don't make it personal um it's really w what's the best and what will work for the project at this right. point so that's how I, I i think that's really true too in terms of um as a teacher as um you know we 
Jing and I both work in communities and we often research within very specific kinds of communities, it comes back into our projects. Um, also when, when she and I work together, um, you know, on Mother Load, as well as um, me working with her as a curator, um, of course, there are many, many challenges because we also know each other very well and in different kinds of ways. And working professionally with each other and being friends, you have to be very mindful of how we do conduct ourselves and what is professionalism, right? And, you know, of course, there were moments when um, Jim was putting together um, her um, High Wire High Seas, which is a very complex project, which I hope she really, really continues with because it's very much happening now. The things that she was tapping into about the Belt and Road Initiative that China is still embarking on. And, you know, we, we always resolved it because like Jing said, it's not personal. We're both, you know, as people, first and foremost, we're there to try to um, achieve certain objectives. And I think that there's a lot of wonderful dynamics. We have advantages, she and I, because we do wear almost the same hats, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, just to answer, uh, respond also as well. There's this, I mean, Alec, are you looking? There's another question here. It's about collaboration. So I think the next two questions, um, they're both related and they deal with the present moment, the contemporary social political issues. So one is by JP. Uh, he asks, it has been six years since Mother Load was produced and so much has happened since then. So if we revisit Mother Load now, uh, do you feel the need to recreate a new film that will dialogue with these new issues? Um, my feeling is that, um, yes, I mean, actually, I don't think any work ends, at least not for me. I feel like, uh, you know, when I, re when I look at work, again, especially like a project like Mother Load, which I haven't seen for quite some time, um, there are things that you might do differently. I mean, and like I said, that happens with every single project I've ever done. Um, and I like that actually, because you can, these issues are inexhaustible. And that when you do the kind of work that I've been doing where they're experimental documentaries and I am using um, history and then also um, current events, current to that time. Um, that's why I keep tagging back on from the piece before. I always try to bring elements back in, certain images back in, and at the same time to really respond to your question in an even more direct way in terms of the issues that you're referring to. I believe there needs to be work that exclusively also focuses on what is happening today. Um, precisely because they are very important to address, right? In line with that, uh, there's also another question by Gina that's related. She's asking about the use of bullets as healing from personal tragedy and inquiring about your process. Has this or has the making of mother load or has the use of these bullets become cathartic for you? And do you still use ammunition as a medium to this day? To answer Gina's uh, question, um, yes, I, I did use uh, bullets to heal, and that was part of my um, presentation earlier also. I said that uh, I, as I was working with these bullets, um, in the beginning, I was really, really scared to even just hold them, um, and then, and as I was working and, you know, hitting them, cutting them up, um, eventually, yes, I was able to neutralize, uh, neutralize using a military term, <laughs> these uh, um, materials. Um, and yeah, and so now I see them as just mere materials. Um, 
they were very loaded psychologically and emotionally with me, but now I can separate them. Um, I do still use some ammunition as a medium in my artwork today, uh, just to bring back uh, and have a continuum uh, with materials and elements within my work. My next question, I want to go back to our protagonist, the Kinari. So reimagining myths in a contemporary moment is so interesting. And other artists also do it, right, Desi? Yeah. And the way you brought, uh, you reimagined the Kinari. It's sci-fi, it's like fantasy. And Miss Jing, I want to ask you uh, what made you pick the Kinari? And did you consider other fantastical creatures or, or mythological monsters like a swang? or uh, like the Manananggal even. Uh, then my follow-up, Miss Angel, when you were collaborating now in this project, uh, how did you feel about uh, the use of Kinari as a protagonist? Did you have a discussion perhaps on changing it or uh, at least when it flew home to the Philippines? Were there aspects about the protagonist that changed? Jing, do you want to go first? Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, I... I in my work, I always try to marry so the past with the issue. So always uh, getting some historical background and bringing it to the contemporary. So whatever issue is happening now, it, because the, the artwork needs to be relevant. Uh, otherwise, you know, it, 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 um, it won't speak to the okay. audience. So um, the scenario, uh, why? The, why I got the canary? You know, I visited the the uh, gold collection. Um, remember my uh, my I lost my father because of a, an issue with the gold. He was um, a, a long story, but anyway, uh, it has relationship with gold um, and uh, you know the the people uh, told him a story of. Um, gold anyway my and my mother also works in the jewelry business so that's also gold and so when I visited the Ayala Museum the gold collection and I was uh, engrossed and obsessed with death I saw the death mask they're all in 24 karat gold and and I was uh, attracted to the kinar because it was a different it wasn't flat it was 3d and mm. it you know up to this day they don't know what it's used for right um and it's an angel, and and um, it flies. So really, I I, I love the wings, <laughs> um, and th that's why I adapted it. Well, first of all, um, I mentioned earlier that how I even got to hear about who Josephine Taraba um, was is that um, I was in New York, and I was soon to move to the Philippines. And um, a very dear friend of mine, um, an artist named Coco Fusco, who Jing happened to be in a, um, in, a, in, a, in a residency with, had called me up and said, have you, you know, have you heard about this Josephine Taralba? And I said, this is weird because I was literally just looking up, looking at her work on, online. And I was so drawn to her performance work that I could see the images and stuff. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, perfect. So I actually was not thinking about another kind or, you know, interacting with Jing to ask her, you know, would she be interested in somehow changing the character more? For me, it was really about, uh, you know, again, how does she take a character and reimagine it for another space for another project. And what was so exciting is that she gave me a lot of freedom to, in the collaboration. So um, we went through a whole process together in terms of, um, I interviewed her to get more parts of her self, story about herself, because then I could think about this canary, this mythical creature who's half animal, half human. And you realize, well, aren't we that <laughs> anyway, right? So, you know, in the process of um, interviewing Jing, I came, I wrote like a poem kind of thing out of certain 
parts of her interview. And that became the text that you see and that you read. And then the way that Jing was moving about the space. So that was really fun too, because um, you're like choreographing and directing and she is also choreographing herself. So there was a really beautiful synergy going on there. And then in terms of the, you know, how fun it was to edit, I love editing. That is where a, a piece is made. But at the same time, I mean, truth be told, I didn't have a lot of um, images that I had in New York. So I, some of the repetition that you see was not intended um, or like a, a few people have seen the, the piece said, Angel, why do you have, you know, such a long clip from the Vietnam stuff? And I said, well, actually, because I didn't have what I wanted to use and I had that stock footage, you know? And so, but I knew I wanted to use something another images, other images of war. And that again, I mean, I think that Jing's character, you have to try to open your mind, or, or, you know, or one would hope that we could open the minds of viewers of an audience to see the metaphors of, of Jing being this kind of um, creature and what she's wearing. I mean, it's, it's really intense. <laughs> Right. right, it's made out of bullets. Right. And her, you know, her jing, her head, her head piece, head piece yeah. made out of um, the primers from the um, top gun show. Right. right. Um, except, except Angel, when the time you asked me to record my voice. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> then, Again, in the spirit of collaboration, I said, okay, she's the director. <laughs> so I complied. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, we, we, when we go back to the Kena reaction, there is also a very interesting coincidence. You know, it, it kind of um, harks back to like the civilization of like um, constant marine trading, like, and, mm. and like the um, constancies of even like exchanges of culture of the language and and this kinari which is like hindu buddhist in in right. nature right and then it's a um it is made in or it is cast in like gold which is um where you know like which is like um called like goes back to the gold mining or no like gold casting like it's an industry that was very much there or present. And this happened way, way b before the, you know, like uh, colonization happened. So it, it's like there, um, there, is the, there is that like shift in um, always um, there, like, con like, again, like the constancy of travel. And then again, the openness of exchange mm. that, you know, that was still, that was alive back then. In, I guess in a way, like finds its way now, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the Silk Roads in many ways is back in the B B R I. It is hmm. in the Belt and Road. I mean, a hundred percent. Right. So I mean, I think that that's there, and I think that, you know, again, um, if you it, there isn't enough time to to really look at the works that both of us presented in depth. But if, if you really had the time, you would be able to see that the linkages are really just so interwoven and that, you know, history is alive in the present. And we are dealing with layers and layers of questions about these things. And what is the relationship between something like gold and violence and various forms of conflict, ter terrorism, what is that? You know, there's so many different forms of it, right? Yeah. I guess in a way, even even back then, when when I was discussing about Anna first of uh, topics, and then um, hearing the how the um, the how mother load itself and the, your each of your practices also came to be, it kind of like 
even back then, like in the 90s with Anna Fur's own concerns, refers to also the same the same kind of um like um ideas, the same mm-hmm. kind of stories, right? And the fact in the, and her concerns this time when it came to territory, the land. Mm-hmm. And um also again going back to woman as the animus. And then I remember the kinary, right? Which is um I guess in a way it's kind of like a vessel. And mm-hmm. vessels would be inscribed in kind of like energy, right? Especially if it's a deity. So mm-hmm. I, I guess I guess in a way that's kind of like how I would also perceive the kinary, right? Despite of like the role that it also that it perhaps played before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, she Alec, came yeah, to life, yeah. right? Right. I mean, in, in Motherlode, you know, and, and that was hard too because the only image that we had was the the, the photograph that Neil Oshima had taken, mm. um, really, <laughs> of, of that object. Yes. Um, and I wish we could have gone into Ayala Museum and gotten permission to shoot it from different angles even. Because if you look yes. really closely at it, it looks like it has a bullet hole. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And I, and yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I was I, like, I, oh. I mean, <laughs> I do, I do believe that it it was caused. I mean, I don't know, but like, um, based on the myths again, the myths that I've heard around the discovery of this cache of Putuan gold was it. It, it was also upon digging or upon the mm-hmm. uncover, right, where it actually got damaged mm-hmm. because it mm-hmm. was a very, you know, like unwitting discovery. And even the way that it traveled hands, right, because mm-hmm. it was gold. So it, it, in a way, like, I guess it somehow found itself in like the hands of, the, of Ayala or like the collector, right? <laughs> Right. <laughs> the collector yeah. themselves who I, I mean, you know, I mean I would I would look into it, but I, I, I don't have the time. But um and I know that part of the damage is the cling the wings of the Kinari were clipped. So mm. yeah, wow. that that was also part of the damage. Like um based uh based on the, the same like um um, story or like the the way that it was also interpreted in the text. Yeah, That's well, it, it's very interesting uh, how gold, uh, uh, gold, which represents economy and economic um, uh, elements, and our history are intertwined. I mean, when the Spanish mm-hmm. came here, they actually it was gold that uh, yeah. kept them here. Right. That's right. Um, and then again, the venue of this place is in Central Bank. I mean, in between right. Central Bank and the Met. The Met at that time had, or at, they, it still owns it. The um, those or was that the Central Bank collection? Sorry, the the belt, the gold belt, and which is now actually in the, I think, uh, Yala Museum. In that yes, exhibition, yes, yeah. it is. Yes, it's owned by um, it's owned by the central bank, but it was exhibited at the Met at that time. Yes, yeah. So really, yes. um, interesting how how they all uh, uh, inter are, are interwoven, um, history and and the current time and yeah. geography. I mean, because and we were sure. we were for sure riffing so much. Um, off of the actual location, right? Here we are mm-hmm. in this fort that the American flag, that was the first place that they hoisted it up on like right before the outbreak of the Philippine American war. And that is also like this incredible kind of, mm-hmm. I mean, for me personally, as someone who's obsessed with the Philippine American war and have done a couple of projects around it, um, that was wonderful. And then you have like this, towering central bank and and uh, you know i was saying to jing like i love this one shot that i because i was so into it where she's like raising her arms and she's going right towards the building and the cannon is in back 
So the way that I shot it, I really deliberately lowered my body down. I, I crouched. Yes. So you were going to get that feeling of this building, which and what it represents. Right. And if you think about all the look at the, the text, I tried to get I mean, yellow is a text that people use for subtitles quite often. But I also really wanted it because of that feeling. I, I tried using a, a color closer to gold, but it wouldn't work. It doesn't mm. work. It didn't work on video. Um, you know, so all of those layers are, are really present there. And, right. you know, again, right. the voices in the text, it's Jing's, it's universal, it's the canary, it's mine, it's the audience's, you know, it's a viewer, mm -hmm. right? So just to bring it all to a close, I want to go back to this idea of weight. So the name of your art, <laughs> load, the heaviness of the cannonballs, Miss Jing was dragging, even the <laughs> It's so on the body and the text on the screen, which in a way, even the font is bold and heavy. And now that in 2020, as you know, we see the centennial of the arrival of the Spanish oh, in the right, 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 so right. Big, this weight of our 500 years of history, the burden of colonization, all the violence that's been done to us. So with all these weight surrounding us, and I think that mother load really brought out, I guess what I want to ask is as artists, art practitioners, curators, educators, um, is there maybe a way perhaps that we can lighten this load? So we, we <laughs> make art, teach, <laughs> exactly. interact. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> carry this idea that our heritage is is broken because in the first place the way we uh, we decided that we were a nation it's not really by our choice it's it's externally imposed upon us that's a lot yeah. alec that you're asking us. i know <laughs> <laughs> but you know we got a, a art um art makes us confront the big questions <laughs> It, it does. does. It does. You're right. Yeah. Mm. I, I'm going to keep it short. Just make art. <laughs> like yeah. and share it. I mean, I share, share it. And, share. and yeah. the viewers, those of you that are in our audience, I mean, many of you, I, I wish we could see you and ask you, you know, about raising your hand, whatever, like, what, you, what do you do? you know, in your life in terms of, you know, and why are you here? You know, um, obviously it has something to do with your interests in, in not just the series, the concept of the series itself, but, and the exhibition that, that Mercedes has put together, but it, you know, it, it has to do very much with the, with the topics, right? And that, so you're all, we're all here for those reasons, right? And I just kind of feel like, yes, history has always been a heavy load, <laughs> right? I mean, and um, I think that if we, if we get stuck in the, all the mm -hmm. terrible things that, that happen when you're colonized um, and the Philippines being colonized more than once. Um, and we get stuck in conflicts that are actual wars, personal wars, all these things. Um, we have a harder time moving forward and lightening that load. And you know, part of what I think Jing and I are hoping with mother load is that that does come further into question. I think Alec, that is why your question is coming out like the, you know, in the way that mm. it is. And also because the quincentenary is a very big deal, right? And it, there are many artists that are gonna be doing amazing things. I mean, Kid Latahemic is going to Spain and gonna be showing in the Crystal Palace, right? And um, 
I just would like to plug uh, yeah. Antony Montadas, who's going to be, um, who's a former mentor of mine, who's going to be uh, exhibiting at Ateneo um, in November, that's also addressing the quincentenary. And he's Catalan. He's, you know, he doesn't identify mm. Spanish, but he's mm -hmm. from Spain. So I think, you know, sorry to ramble, but I do think that, that to just kind of open it up to the, the audience, you know, we all have a role here, right? It, you know, right. That, you know, how do we take this load off? Well, let's throw it back to you who we can't see. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Just thoughts to think about after this whole thing wraps up. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Like any, considerations. Any last uh, thoughts pa ba on for the audience before we close? <laughs> well, yeah, I want to echo uh, Angel that you you know you don't want to get stuck in um, um, the history and um, really one of the things to to help us move forward is to stop blaming the other or others. And just history is history, as my as my son would say, it is what it is. <laughs> and then and then, you know, you could recreate and recreate right. uh, to move forward. Yeah. Right. My to my final criticism. Yeah, <laughs> or being self-critical, critical thinking, critical analysis. I mean, we're all mixed people. Mm -hmm. Filipinos were 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 Oscals in many ways, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that that we do need to know our history, histories, mm -hmm. those of, of of our own and of others, or else we will not evolve as a civilization. I mean, that's right. bottom line. Of course. Um, in, in my case, like thinking about reconciling with a personal heritage, right? And we are getting increasingly virtual as a society. So I, I mean, honestly, like I would suggest to keep inquiring, keep investigating, Keep updating. Even the paradigms that I spoke of earlier about cultural heritage will mm -hmm. always need, it's not a gold standard at all. And I would believe that one of one of the things to move forward is to be in solidarity with those of lesser voice, of lesser power. Like that's that's also one thing to keep in mind. Definitely. Oh, so that's all the time today. Thank you so much, Miss Angel, Miss Jing, and Desi. A virtual thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you so much. Okay. Thanks for, for Thanks thank for you, everyone. <laughs> I revert to uh, Daniel Devella, our assistant director for exhibitions and programs, for the closing. Well, thank you all for joining us this morning for the second installment of Art Inspires. Uh, send us your thoughts and comments through the evaluation form. We would love to hear from you and your feedback will help us in preparing for our future events as we gear up for the reopening of the Metropolitan Museum of Manila's new art spaces in Bonifacio Global City towards the end of the year. So to those who would like to receive an e-certificate, kindly fill up the evaluation form which will appear after you close this Zoom meeting. Lastly, we invite everyone to like and follow the Metropolitan Museum of Manila for updates on our programs and offerings um, and our future exhibitions. On July 31, we will be hosting an illustration workshop for children, so we hope to see you there. Check the Zoom chat or Facebook comment section for the links. Happy weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jing. Thank okay. you, Angel. Thank you, Tina. Great to have you.